Moving on, we have the second technical session on uh, industrial applications of AI and AR VR technologies. The session will have three research presentations from academia and industry. The session is chaired by Dr. V. Rajkumar, who is an assistant professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Jammu. Prior working as a research prior, he was working as a research fellow at the Center for Laser Aided Intelligent Manufacturing, University of Michigan, USA, and as a postdoctoral research fellow at the Digital Manufacturing and Des Design Center, Singapore. University of Technology and Design. He completed his PhD thesis at Auckland University of Technology, New Zealand in selective laser sintering of specific biopolymer composites for biomedical applications. Dr. Velu is also the recipient of the prestigious Gates Scholarship, Best All-Rounder Award, Best Outgoing Student Gold Medal for his academic performances at the university level. He has more than 30 publications, work, he generated more than uh, 30 publications from his research activities, and he received a scientific research award at an international conference conducted by Philadelphia University of Jordan 2010. Welcome you, sir, for chairing the session. Thank you. We have uh, Dr. Sham Sundar Mandayam, is, who is a co-chair for this session. Dr. Sham is a BE Metallurgy from MS University, Baroda, and a PhD from IIT Kharagpur. He is a former principal scientist, a quality and innovation leader at GE Global Research from 2000 to 2020, and a former senior scientific officer at IGCAR and has 37 plus years experience in innovation, research, technology, and he's also a trainer with deep domain expertise in the multidisciplinary area of non-destructive evaluation. He's currently Ma mentoring, advising, and incubating a few startups and pioneering the adoption of NDE 4.0 and inspection through digital transformation. We welcome you, sir, for co-chairing the session. So, uh, Dr. Sham is also presenting the paper in this track. Uh, the presentations uh, will be evaluated by the chair of the session, Dr. V. Raj Kumar. Now, I would like to hand over this track to the co-chair, Dr. Sham. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neha, for the introduction and uh, welcome to uh, everybody uh, attending the session, including uh, the chair, Dr. Rajkumar. Welcome to you to this uh, second technical track of today's uh, conclave. Uh, as already mentioned by Dr. Neha, I, uh, we have three presentations and uh, I believe we'll uh, have uh, 30 minutes for each of the presentation, which includes 20 minutes uh, for the presentation and about 10 minutes for uh, Q&A for each. And then we'll uh, have uh, uh, both uh, the chair, Dr. Rajkumar, and myself kind of summarizing at the end of that. Uh, with that, uh, maybe I, uh, uh, Dr. Rajkumar, do you want to have, make some initial comments before I invite the first speaker? I think it's good to go now. Yeah, we'll OK, it. great, fine. Yeah. So then uh, uh, I think uh, I'll invite the first speaker. Uh, for this uh, technical session, and that is uh, Dr. Kirit Modi, who is a professor and head at the Sankalchan Patel University. Uh, uh, Dr. Modi, if you're there, uh, you can please uh, take over and uh, briefly introduce yourself and get into the presentation, please. Okay, so uh, I'm very much thankful uh, to the this uh, NASCOM and the IIT uh, Gandhinagar and IIT Jammu for giving me this opportunity to uh, present uh, my innovative topic uh, in this uh, today's uh, the Smart Manufacturing Research Conclave. So I'm very uh, much thankful to uh, the respective uh, the session chairs. So I would like to, uh, okay, first of all, I would like to say about me, uh, my name is Dr. Kirit Jamodi, and at present I work as a professor and head of the department at computer and IT department at the Sakharjan Patel uh, University, Vishnagar, as well as I'm also work as a dean of the faculty of the computer science. And uh, by considering uh, the uh, topic of this uh, conclave, so I have uh, identified the topic on which even I have published in the, one of the, the paper, uh, and even I am associated with these, uh, the IoT. So now I would like to share my screen first.
so I think my screen is visible uh, to you, sir. Yeah. So may I proceed, sir? Yeah, it's visible. I think you can proceed. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, uh, so topic which I have uh, the uh, selected for this uh, conclave, it is about the social IoT, uh, which help us to add the intelligence uh, to the IoT as well as especially we can say the industrial IoT domain. And uh, I would like to just summarize about the uh, uh, about topic is that we know that Internet of the Things uh, has gathered significant importance uh, because of that we are able to interconnect the various kinds of the objects in the form of the sensors, actuators. So we are able to interconnect all the various kind of the devices together. And with the help of that, now we are able to uh, uh, connect the various kinds of the devices and we are able to create that kind of the uh, universal network. And with the help of that, we are able to uh, develop the applications like smart home, smart transportation, smart agriculture, as well as it is also possible to apply uh, this kind of the network in the industrial applications. So uh, that is the uh, advantage which we are getting with the help of the, uh, the IoT at this moment. But when we think about uh, one step ahead, then social IoT has the, uh, the uh, way to support the kind of the existing services. So with the help of the social IoT, now it becomes possible that we, we can take the advantage of not only the Internet of the Things network, but we can also uh, think about the social network which exists and uh, the various people, they are connected with each other with the help of the social network. So uh, the benefit which we can take from the social networking is uh, it is possible that we can uh, achieve the scalability, trustworthiness, as well as we are able to identify the resources that is we can say the resource discovery so these things are uh, some of the the benefits which we can add into the uh, the existing our iot uh, for the various kind of the application domains so i would like to say in in the introduction part that the iot describes uh, uh, that uh, new world of the billions of the objects which are intelligently uh, they are connected they are able to communicate but when we think about the social iot so it's uh, the concept where we want to integrate the social networks with the internet of the things and with the help of that uh, the results is that integrating social uh, the network into the iot has been increasingly witnessed not only the applications uh, related to the smart home or uh, just limited to the uh, smart transportation, but it is also possible to apply uh, to the product designing and the manufacturing. So uh, I would like to uh, specify here uh, a very uh, simple example that is uh, how we can apply the social IoT. It is about the household garbage pickup one, and it is already implemented uh, at this pain. So as per our daily routine, uh, we know that there is a garbage pickup one, so it's coming and uh, collecting the as per the predefined route, so collecting the garbage. But uh, sometimes when the amount of the garbage is uh, the different, uh, it may be uh, sometimes higher than the usual quantity, then it uh, the routine schedule is disturbed. So how we can uh, utilize that in the case that a sensor can be attached to the container, which can fetch the real-time data of the garbage weight. And in this way, by using this data, more amount of garbage uh, could be collected efficiently. So what I would like to uh, specify here with this example is if, if we are able to establish that kind of the machine to machine, the communication, then uh, if the, uh, the, uh, our existing that uh, the garbage pickup one is able to uh, uh, talk with the container, then we can easily find out the solution and the things can go a uh, uh, very uh, simple and efficient way. So there are the certain uh, the advantages to think about the social IoT. So social IoT structure can be shaped uh, as required to guarantee the network navigability and with the help of that, 
the objects and services are performed effectively so what we can achieve the scalability is guaranteed uh, like in the human social network so at this moment we know that we have the uh, various social uh, networks which are exist and uh, we can see the scalability as well as this trustworthiness is is uh, clearly achieved so we can also achieve the same in the iot network and so it is mentioned here level of trustworthiness can be established for leveraging the degree of the interaction and models designed to study the social networks can be used so uh, what uh, i have seen here the advantage is that uh, we know that at one side we have the uh, the iot network where our interest is that how we are able to connect the uh, various kind of the objects uh, how we are able to interconnect uh, with the, uh, the internet and how they are able to communicate and they connect with each other uh, to get the kind of the intelligence and uh, how we can develop the intelligent applications at the same time in parallel to that we also have the social uh, the network and uh, the people are using this uh, the social network for sharing uh, their ideas for communicating uh, their views and all the thing so how we can uh, club these two uh, the networks and how we can uh, get the uh, value addition in, in various kind of the applications so so this provides again uh, that kind of the the evolution that happens so uh, we uh, have the internet of the things for things to things communication from that we move towards the internet of the things so how we can uh, achieve the uh, machine to machine communication as well as human to human communication and now our interest is that uh, when we have these two kind of the two different the communication models how we can uh, achieve uh, that kind of the uh, the new enhanced model where we can uh, add the social values into our the uh, machine to machine communications so uh, that is our the next uh, objective or interest and uh, i have uh, referred uh, the documents and i have seen that he, there is a taxonomy of the social iot is uh, the presented in the literatures so it provides some of the key components related to the social iot uh, domain and uh, we have the things like the architecture the relationship management trust management uh, there are some technical components exist through which we can uh, achieve the objective of the social iot so we can uh, use web services information uh, related uh, the activities and several tools are av available so this uh, provides uh, us the information when we have the plan to uh, go further in the uh, area of the social iot how we can achieve it uh, what are the possible uh, the ways are available and how we can uh, achieve the siot at, at the ground level so uh, with reference to the, the taxonomy now i would like to uh, provide here the the basic architecture and this architecture provides us the way how the uh, social iot looks like so here we have the layered architecture and we can see we have the three uh, the components are uh, presented here and these three components are uh, we can say the key to the iot network they are called the object uh, the gateways and the uh, SIoT server, so through which we are able to establish the network. And again, if we see uh, the uh, uh, this layered architecture, so it is divided into three uh, key layers. They are called the the sensing layer, network layer, and application layer. And at the application layer, we can see there are some of the key components which are mentioned, and they are the pillars uh, to implement the social iot so they are uh, we can say the relationship management service discovery service composition and the trustworthiness so in short uh, it defines the how we are able to uh, create the relationship management how we are able to work with the service orientation and how we can uh, go for the the trustworthy uh, or or we can say trust uh, management part uh, there, there are uh, several kinds of the relationships are also uh, defined in the SIOT and this defines that how we are able to 
uh, relate uh, the objects which are part of the our social iot so they are defined in terms of the parental objects where we have the one single owner who is own the different uh, the smart objects and uh, here the example is like uh, how we have the homogeneous objects originated in the uh, at the particular at the same time duration by the same manufacturer similarly we have the co location uh, object relationship so where we can consider that there are different kind of the, the sensor actuators to this kind of the objects so they are working as a part of the like smart home or smart city the next is ownership uh, object relationship so where uh, the how we are able to uh, uh, we can say the establish among the heterogeneous of ob objects which belongs to the same user so how uh, one user is uh, uh, actually uh, associated or control the different objects so the examples like the uh, mobile phones which are the connected uh, as a part of the uh, one single network then social object relationships so established when uh, objects come into the contact uh, either uh, the periodically or the continuously and because their owners come into touch with uh, each other during their lives so this is about that how we social object relationship uh, is is defined here that is devices and sensors belongs to the friends classmates and the the colleagues so in this way these are the different kinds of the the relationships which exist and uh, this uh, is associated with the siot uh, now i would like to uh, present these uh, siot uh, uh, the need of the siot uh, especially in the area of the manufacturing segment so we know that there is a need of the ss management is gradually increased in the manufacturing sector and effective uh, asset management is is uh, required uh, to reduce the cost of the asset ownership while improving the uh, machine uh, availability guaranteed security and increasing productivity so modern uh, industrial assets are equipped with uh, the different kind of sensors monitoring their conditions and operational status so generating large amount of the data so the thing is that the rise of the, the data collection and analytics in the social iot has naturally progressed to uh, help uh, these industrial applications so in social iot intelligent machines with the social properties uh, such as the social assets so they can share information and cooperate uh, via the social networks and in this way we can achieve the, uh, the system level performance so with social iot individual machines can provide status updates to the social networks and in this way they can share their condition and operational status with the other machines uh, that subscribe to the network so the thing that thing is possible uh, again we have one example here that related to the mining uh, application so in the mining operation site that consists of the variety of the capital intensive equipments so if we think about a situation a scenario where a crusher can decrease its speed to reduce the downstream loads thus helping the conveyor whose condition is uh, excessively deteriorating at the uh, current loading level right so alternatively the crusher can send a message to the human operator elaborating that the problem and the suggesting a possible solution such as the slow down the crusher in addition assuming a truck a truck has the experience a sudden breakdown because of the gear failure so this truck will be able to send a warning message to the another truck at a remote site with gears from the such badge so a uh, same base sorry so in, instead of passively waiting for the instructions machine actually actively uh, participating here in the production process and in this way they are the uh, the enhancing the effectiveness of the uh, the site uh, the performance so uh, the next is about uh, the siot in the performance management the possibility for the machine learning and the optimizations are we know that the importance of that where machines in the factories uh, they can uh, they collect update and share the status data uh, even through the social network so this is possible so siot enhances industrial data analysis and performance management at the different aspects at the machine level 
production plant level and the network level so these things are even defined here so it is possible we can achieve the uh, the performance uh, in, uh, the enhancement uh, so moreover with the intelligent machines uh, looking after the system and themselves sorting the latent risk and executing solutions or suggesting solutions to human operators the efficiency of the maintenance is greatly enhanced in the future world of the manufacturing intelligent machines will communicate and cooperate with each other uh, through social network to accomplish the production task uh, which very much uh, resembles the human society so we know that we have the at present the social network which works where we know that the things are performed in a way uh, uh, where we are also adding the the social values so how we can add this kind of the social values into the uh, the iot applications so uh, at the concluding point i would like to say that the social iot can be viewed as a mix of the the traditional networks as well as social networks where things autonomously establish social relationship according to the on a social network and seek trusted things that can provide services needed when they come into contact with each other opportunistically and uh, even at the end i would like to say that uh, we uh, we are observing social iot mainly for the applications such as the home automations and all these but beyond that uh, it is also possible that we can uh, enhance the capability of the social iot's so it could be beneficial for industrial equipments where machines that self learn leveraging or enhancing other experience to optimize maintenance cost so i would like to say at the end the statement which i have actually uh, uh, seen on the some of the Mm, the resources uh, so they are working on this social iot so when things get smart the internet of the things get social so in this way uh, now it, it is possible that we are able to uh, get the benefits of the iot industrial iot in addition to that how we can also take the benefit of the the social networks for uh, our industrial applications yeah so with this uh, i would like to uh, thank you again for giving me this opportunity uh, to present uh, the topic so uh, by considering uh, the uh, i can say the title of this research conclave that is smart manufacturing uh, so i have uh, tried to add Uh, the applicability of the social iot in the uh, we can say uh, smart manufacturing domain thank you thank you sir thank you <clears throat> so thank you uh, dr modi for a very interesting uh, presentation and frankly i should uh, um, confess that yeah i have heard the term only first time <laughs> social iot i've heard of iiot the industrial internet of things but siot is something uh, i am frankly hearing for the first time so very interesting uh, uh, concept so i guess the uh, floor is now open for questions to dr modi yeah so can i ask some couple of questions to just in doubts yeah yes. please go ahead yeah yes so thanks modi uh, so it's really as uh, uh, dr syam mentioned it seems to be interesting uh, you know social iot and that is adding intelligence uh, to the internet of things uh, though i'm not uh, more uh, you know more of uh, core with the uh, computer science background we are working on machine learning and iot things to our manufacturing right. applications uh, but however i just want to clarify some doubts how are you going to maintain the security for sharing the information in this social yeah life? actually that, that is the actually one of the key features sir uh, i would like to say here uh, when we think about the social iot so there are three th uh, we can say features uh, which we want to uh, uh, specifically highlight here or we want to uh, provide here one is the scalability second is trust trustworthiness that is all about so it is sir the way how because when we think about the the social network 
so we know we we are following the concept of the trustworthiness so which is there in that part right so here uh, sir even i have referred the various kind of the literatures even even i have when i tried to uh, the club this uh, uh, social iot especially for the uh, smart manufacturing uh, the application so i have seen that ki even uh, the lots of uh, the articles they are published on the trust management so uh, that is one of the uh, key component uh, so among the three the components which are highlighted one is the that is about uh, first one is the scalability second is the trust management or that trustworthiness and third one is the that is how we are able to work for the uh, resource uh, uh, discovery and the composition so it is all about the social computing uh, part so these three things are uh, highlighted by the different researchers so uh, they have given the enough emphasis on that part okay, how we can provide that enough the privacy and the, the security in that sense sir okay 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 thanks thanks for the clarity and uh, one more thing so what type of protocol has been used siot uh in terms of these are uh, the protocol uh, at this moment uh, even i have seen that there various kind of the the resources so uh, even even i have worked with the uh, traditional model of the uh, the web services where uh, we are mainly working with the web services which i have uh, even provided in the taxonomy part so the with the help of the the web services and the existing uh, the technology which we are using for the the communication so we can use that part so uh, one more thing is that it is about the sir web services and uh, along with the web services even uh, we can also add uh, the concept of semantic web so with the help of the ontology so this become possible we can add that kind of the knowledge base into the resources and uh, we are able to uh, uh, use uh, that concept of the web services related technologies uh, for the implementation okay so yeah that, uh, thanks for that clarity as well and uh, third question uh, i mean maybe the final one i'm just thinking about it uh, when i come across your uh, you know papers and other thing you the concept that you have applied within a, a smart home like yeah. you are talking about transferring some power from one device to other which needs it and of course it is not you mentioned it is not necessary that belongs to the same type of objects right sir so and but the relation between the heterogeneous object that can be also established based on the work efficiently with the system this is the discussion i remember which you gave so right. in this, uh, yeah, how this concept is working between the heterogeneous object and what type of controller is used so that is what uh, i want to just yeah actually so uh, to uh, give the answer to uh, the question this question these are so really a very important question so even i have uh, referred the lots of the the research articles but even i have not uh, actually seen the full page or the complete implemented the solution uh, but sir uh, even uh, actually i am uh, working with the iot part so even we that that is the challenge which we are facing ki how we can achieve seamless integration among the different kinds of the iot objects so definitely sir you are right but and uh, the thing is that ki now because uh, why i am highlighting this is uh, we know that we already have the uh, well established the social network and we we are actually now even uh, working with the iot so now if we can uh, club these two concepts then definitely we can uh, get some uh, the uh, good features from uh, both these uh, the networks but as you mentioned sir these are some of the challenges even they are also uh, applicable uh at the at the both the level of the networks at the iot level as well as sir it is applicable social networks so i think uh, these are some challenges which i have not included in this presentation but that is all about heterogeneity how we get able to uh, establish the communication among them yes yes of course there is a significant uh, you know parameters i uh, as far as my knowledge and my concern right yes. sir 
anyway thanks uh, thanks for your uh, thank you thank you sir and uh, definitely i will try to even uh, uh, even uh, do some more work on that part so the, because uh, interest is that if we can get some kind of the uh, the prototypes or even some solutions even i have referred lots of documents when i am try try to relate this social iot especially for the industrial application so definitely uh, this kind of the uh, the solution if we can get from some of the research organization then it help lot yeah, sure. to sure. uh, go further yeah. thank, thank you thank you sir thank you sir, thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, i see yeah i see uh, mr oh. amit saluja has raised his hand so maybe you want to go ahead yeah dr kirit i mean first of all um, i think this is definitely no i mean from my point of view also this is novel i mean uh, and when i saw the topic also i was little kind of in surprise what i'm going to hear so uh, absolutely i mean i think you have really picked a great topic and the concept also looks very exciting to me and uh, i think whatever the questions i had and dr rajkumar has mostly asked you those questions so i think my most of the questions are already answered by you because th these were exactly the same concerns or kind of pointers that i had um, and while I think we have already talked about one challenge, which is more of an heterogeneity of the different devices. So that definitely becomes as a one. Um, and this is still an initial stage, what you're talking, correct? We really have to test it out and then see what more different ways to kind of and, and make it uh, make it basically uh, implementable for the industry. Uh, security is one I still feel. I mean, whenever you talk of social network, security immediately comes to the mind, right? And Dr. Rajkumar touched upon it. So that's definitely, I think, uh, maybe you should spend more time and then see um, uh, what's the level of securities are here. Then apart from this, uh, any other challenges do you foresee or have you thought over, which basically say you might not have brought about now, but uh, definitely we can take this concept forward or rather we should take this concept forward. I mean, there should be a um, uh, way to kind of and, and make it forward. So we can identify a certain industry who, who would like to kind of and do some pilot on this and then would like to use it. And then um, some kind of and prototypes can be developed um, by working with the IITs and together with the other experts. So this definitely should be taken forward. Uh, but from a challenges point of view, uh, have you, thought of any any more areas gray areas where you feel i mean um, we could face a roadblock or a, or where basically uh, say you would prefer to kind of and work more to validate your concept and the and the thought process that you have yeah actually sir uh, the whatever the resources even uh, i have seen in terms of the research articles and all the the contributions uh, uh, which have been done on this topic so even i have seen that uh, some level of the work has been done, but now there is a need to uh, go for the kind of the prototype development. And even uh, now with the help of that, uh, even whatever the uh, basic case studies, even with I have discussed, so even at least if we can implement those uh, things uh, in, in some of the, uh, uh, at, at some extent, then definitely we can even identify some uh, uh, we can say um, uh, better, or, or from better the example that you quoted from that mining correct i mean work yeah, yeah. yes do you yes. find so, some more yes um, areas that were so i think I, I, yeah sir so i would like to say at this moment uh, 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 we have even uh, ad adopted these uh, machine to machine kind of the communication mainly for the smart city kind of the applications but even we can uh, consider that for the industrial, uh, the application industrial domain. So I think that helps a lot, especially when now we are uh, thinking about the smart factories and all these things. Even I have just uh, read uh, those things, even I have not worked with. But now when we have the smart factories and smart manufacturing, so definitely uh, this kind of the concept uh, will help in that sense because uh, we all are connected uh, with the help of the social network so if we somewhere if we can integrate the social network with these uh, our industrial requirements and definitely uh, it will be the beneficial yes absolutely so 
and i think you rightly said smart cities yes definitely i think it it becomes still um much easier for it to implement right. like for example the air pollution kind of an application or the right. traffic management with the sensors at the uh, those traffic signals so bringing those in that social network could i think um, there'll be maybe a good pilot also to have because i think relatively that will, could be a little easier than the industrial one so uh yes. still yeah good work so so i am very much thankful for uh, for the the uh, from uh, the iit gandhinagar iit jammu for conducting uh, this kind of the research conclave and uh, this is really a very good platform and, and it's thank a you pleasure thank to you. have you here I mean, and and yeah. i think we'll have neha work with you more closely and then identify uh, what are the different ways we can take it forward yes yes okay thank you thank you sir thank you, thank you. i uh, know we are just out of time uh, yes yes is there yes. but uh, uh, i would i mean uh, given that uh, only three presentations we do have a luxury of maybe exceeding by a minute or two so if there are any more questions either from the panelists or the audience uh, this may be the time to ask i do not see anything so maybe i last the final question and uh, just go over by a minute maybe uh, is that have you uh, as part of your research or any other documented research uh, um, actually uh, found the uh, benefits uh, coming of uh, coming out of using siot versus uh, general iot in terms of either financial or uh, you know productivity or anything is there any uh, you know documented uh, um, quantitative benefits which has been uh, studied by anybody uh, actually yes sir. some at some level uh, even researchers they have uh, the provided even some the empirical results so they have provided that yeah definitely so okay. there are some the cost reduction is possible as well as the productive uh, the enhancement is possible because uh, we we already uh, we know that the social network is a very effective way of the communication but here our interest is that how we can add the social uh, the uh, value in the our industrial iot part so in this way whenever the things become uh, we can say somewhat because we we already uh, they applied the uh, ai machine learning uh, to the our iot domain so in this way we already uh, made our the iot part the intelligent enough so where if they can uh, take some kind of the adaptive uh, kind of the behavior then that help to make the things even uh, uh, more smarter and uh, um, more improved yes so that is the objective okay great thank you thanks thank for you. your answers and uh, uh, thank you dr modi for an excellent presentation and i think we had some good discussions and clarifications so thank you once again for uh, having participated in the conclave and given us a uh, overview of a very uh, novel topic called social iot so thank you very much thank you thank you with that uh, we'll move on to the second presentation of the uh, uh, this uh, particular technical uh, track and uh, that is going to be uh, presented by mr tarun purohit who is a ceo of wimelight it research private uh, limited so mr purohit if you are uh, there could you please take over and uh, give you a, give a brief introduction about yourself and then uh, go ahead and uh, jump into the main topic <clears throat> thank you good afternoon uh, can everyone hear me yes so yeah. um, i am shantanu uh, i am presenting on behalf of mr tarun purohit uh, he was uh, unable to join today uh, so i'll be uh, presenting on his behalf uh, can i share my screen yes please is my screen visible yeah okay. so the topic uh, for uh, our research paper was enabling the most ideal manufacturing setup through creation of uh, digital twins so uh, before we begin a little bit of background about ourselves uh, limelight it is a firm that uh, works in the domain of uh, industrial iot solutions we provide large to small industries with custom industrial iot solutions which enable iotization and digitization we have developed our proprietary hardware and software technologies uh, for enabling this uh, platform and uh, we till date we've served multiple clients like uh, jbm maruthar sethi engineering and others uh, mostly based in gujarat uh, and a few of them based out of delhi and cr as well so <clears throat> Uh, not talking too much about our platform our platform is essentially a uh, combines the use of hardware and software 
through technologies like edge computing and cloud computing to get the most efficient and the most effective uh, iotization and digitization solution for msmes at a very very low cost as it is designed completely in house now uh, we will talk about <clears throat> the research paper and this is just the abstract the contents of what we are going to cover today so we will talk talking about uh, how to enable the most efficient the most ideal manufacturing setup so in our experience we've come across multiple things in industry 4.0 and we have various thoughts around it one of the thoughts was digital twin and why it should be there so talking about industry 4.0 industry 4.0 is essentially a solution is essentially a methodology which enables a complete digitization and iotization of the setup now why must we do the digitization why must we create the digital twin why must we enable iot in the end the manufacturer any manufacturer's objective is to be more profitable is to be more scalable is to be have better quality is to have lesser costs and higher profit margins so one method of enabling the most ideal manufacturing setup is through iotization is through digitization and that is industry 4.0 so industry 4.0 if we begin with has to work if manufacturing needs to be optimized if costs need to be optimized reduced it needs to begin with the creation of the digital twin which is a method to gather data now why is data important so it's a very very basic philosophy that if you uh, must mr shankar i'm sorry to interrupt uh, are you actually moving your slides or are you still on the first slide i am at uh, abstract i'm on the third slide okay so okay fine so i was wondering by any chance if the slides are not moving so if you are on this slide then stay. sorry sorry for the interruption start right now so <clears throat> yes so it's a very uh, we start with a very very basic philosophy if you must improve something if you must make something ideal you must know everything about it so you must have every data point you must have every analysis every method of data capturing to actually enable you with enough information to make a solid decision and that's essentially how ai works that's essentially how machine learning works you need you need to feed x amount of data you need to have x amount of clarity on the process on every part of the system to actually improve it so that is the importance of data now data is gathered by something called a digital twin so if we look at manufacturing there are essentially three any manufacturing unit manufacturing anything on the planet has essentially three key components man machine and material now to <clears throat> enable capturing of data a digital twin must be created of all of these three the man the machine and the material a digital twin is a, is, a, is essentially a digital replica of the physical ent entity which enables all of the data to be monitored easily and through any sort of system or device the most ideal manufacturing bro broadly can be defined in two parameters one is a metric for defining the speed and efficiency of manufacturing that's called the oee overall equipment effectiveness and we will take a look at that on the later slides and another like i mentioned earlier any manufacturing can be defined as the cost it is taking or energy it is taking to produce one unit of manufacturing now so if you must make the manufacturing ideal it can be defined through oee through cost per unit rupees per unit or through kilowatt hour or that is energy per unit now let's dive right in the most ideal manufacturing means everything is perfect that means every machine is running at 100% uptime <clears throat> every person is at 100% productivity every material is moving as fast as possible there are no losses there are no quality defects there is no bottlenecks in the chain and everything runs as smooth as fast and as effectively as possible that is the definition of most ideal like keeping all of the resources that we have the cash that we have the machines that we have the man that we have the, and the materials that we have keeping all of those constant what is the most ideal what is the most optimized and what is the most 
efficient use of the resources that we have is the most ideal manufacturing and that is the basis of what we want to achieve through our journey now process <clears throat> to begin with data is very very important like we said we cannot optimize anything which we don't know which we don't understand and data today in industry there is actually very little data present and even that is broadly captured very very manually so it is captured on a piece of paper and doesn't have any sort of historical data or any sort of analysis or any sort of visualizations available so the first thing that we must do is capture all of the data in a very solid format now we must acquire data of uh, i'm sorry there's a mistake there we must acquire data of the man the machine and the materials now data of man is essentially who was present where was he present and what was his overall productivity so if he had 12 working hours and he was supposed to be at his desk or at his machine or at his operation for 10 hours so where was he actually and what was his overall productivity through various sorts of correlations that we will cover in the next slides we will understand what is productivity a machine so if a machine we need to capture the data the cap the core data that a machine needs to ca be captured of is essentially production and health so production is essentially how many units of manufacturing did the machine do in a certain given period of time or throughout whenever the data capturing process is on what was the health of the machine again that is a dynamic parameter and <clears throat> materials what is the inventory that we have what is the raw material that we have and at what part of the process chain or the supply chain is it at currently is it at just input is it has it passed process 1 process 2 or is it ready to dispatch so what is the status of the inventory the materials that we have now there are two types of data that we must capture static and dynamic static as the name suggests is something that doesn't change so the static data for a machine would be the make model and the type of the machine what does it do what is its rated specs all of that is static data dynamic data also must be captured what that is the health of the machine health of the machine can be processed through parameters like current through parameters like vibration temperature humidity and various things so through the data capture in the data capturing process to make sense of it static and dynamic both are extremely important now this is what a typical architecture for any iot solution looks like there are multiple sensors and uh, wirelessly connected through to a gateway uh, and that is the picture of uh, a representation of the gateway that we deploy the sensors ping the data to the gateway the gateway through wifi pushes all of the data onto a cloud and through the cloud there is a dashboard where you can view all of the data have the historic data analysis have a dashboard with visual with basic visualizations basic analysis and that is how any data capturing or iot implementation today looks like sorry now a unified database so there are a lot of distributed solutions out there some solutions give a uh, data for machine monitoring or production monitoring some solutions give so data for man monitoring or worker productivity monitoring some give material tracking or inventory tracking based solutions but there is need for a unified database a unified database includes data from all these three key uh, resources that any manufacturing has so uh, what a unified database will do for us is essentially have availability of real time data and visualizations reductions of manpower costs for data entry and monitoring no human error while entering the data at times there are intentional errors uh, for various sorts of uh, pro uh, process production and uh, various sorts of issues that are faced so there are intentional errors at this point as well and availability of historic data this itself just a database with all of the data together on one single dashboard can lead to shorter turnaround times for have it making sure that machines stay up workers stay available and there is no shortage of raw materials so these a basic unified database can enable these three things which itself enhances efficiency and uh, 
uh, efficiency of any manufacturing unit by even up to 10%, which would be a huge cost. Equations. So a key metric for understanding the performance of any machine or any manufacturing process today, uh, and this is recognized worldwide, is called OEE or the overall equipment effectiveness. The overall equipment effectiveness takes into account three parameters, the availability, the performance, and the quality. The availability means that is runtime divided by total time. So if, you, if we have 100% availability, that means our machine was running for all of the time that it was there. So if the total time of uh, data capturing is 12 hours, the machine was on for 12 hours. Performance is equal to actual speed divided by normal speed. So essentially 100% performance means our machine was acting and producing as fast as it can. So if our machine was supposed to make five parts in one minute, it was making exactly five parts in one minute, not four, not three. So that means 100% performance. And quality is essentially if our unit was supposed to be 18 meters long, it is always going to be 18 meters long. That means 100% quality. All of these data points can be empirically uh, calculated and can be monitored through a solid IoT implementation. So all of this data can be then acquired to understand what is the current situation. Our machines, our, our people, our materials, what is the current situation and what can be done to perhaps improve. So <clears throat> once we have all of this data, static and dynamic, a root cause analysis is done at every shift. So if overall equipment effectiveness was less than 100%, a root cause analysis is done. So essentially, if a particular shift had 80% uptime, and a root cause analysis would lead to the possible reasons why the shift itself had 80% uptime and why not 100%. So what was the reason for that 20%? How can it be optimized? Was, that, was there an unplanned machine failure? Was there an unplanned downtime? If there is a planned downtime, how can we reduce those uh, times? If a worker perhaps is working, if a worker conti continuously shows that three different shifts, he was showing that the machine had 80% uptime, but other workers had 90% or 95% uptime, then suitable training can be made for that worker. Then if there was a particular machine that is always running up at 100% uptime and there is always material posted before that machine, that means that machine is always running at capacity. Maybe a capacity planning or an optimization of capacity can be done to increase machines such that materials are not held up. So the, co the, the core analysis would be identification of the problems that come with manufacturing, identification of the bottlenecks that come with manufacturing, of the capacities, and overall process optimization. A lot of this can be done through AI-enabled correlations, which enable the correlations of which man, because when I was giving the examples, it seemed very simple, but in any medium or to large manufacturing unit, there are going to be multiple such permutations and combinations where it cannot be spotted by just human analysis. So through AI-based correlations, we can understand what are the possible optimizations or what about the possible root causes of downtimes or reductions in efficiencies which would then lead to continuous optimization and continuous data. Again, data of the optimizations also fed back to the AI such that an overall process optimization takes place of man, machine, and material leading to usage of 100% capacity. The best manufacturing setup would enable minimizing these two parameters with keeping the quality of manufacturing constant. The two parameters are again, cost and energy. That was the presentation. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shantanu, for a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions to Mr. Shantanu. Can I start my questions? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. Please, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sham, and uh, thank you, Shantanu. It's really interesting. 
know presentation that you are enabling the most ideal manufacturing and uh, set up through the digital twin so that is the current sesira so i have to some couple of things to discuss with you so using digital twin whenever we are talking about the digital twin all these things so whenever uh, the digital uh, digital twin comes the data acquisition is you know complete without any losses but in a real time scenario is it quite possible or impossible what's your comment so uh, thank you sir thank you for this question so in our experience you are absolutely right creating the digital twin is if the data throughput from the device to the cloud is there and it's there 100% that there is no losses in power of the device or device failure itself if we don't have that uh, making a digital twin becomes very very difficult you are absolutely right sir that is a key constraint that is a key hurdle we have as a uh, part of our organization we have come up with various solutions to that problem so a lot of times what happens is there is loss in internet connectivity so the answer to that is that we use local uh, data storages so we keep capturing the data and we use local data storages such that they are uh, when the internet comes back it is pushed through cloud sometimes again what happens is that the workers the workforce on on the floor they tamper with the device because they are not very used to technological interventions so they tamper with the device which again leads to downtime so then we place our devices in such a way that they are in lock and key so typically in the electrical panels we place the devices such that they are not open to tampering <laughs> thirdly if there is power loss so if there is a complete manufacturing power loss our devices would shut down uh, at that point the data is not very critical because again the manufacturing itself has shut down due to power loss but we do have some amount of battery backup on the devices such that they keep acquiring the data till the power comes back online but uh, again sir that was uh, in our early days in our early journey that was a very key challenge that we faced uh, getting throughput and getting continuous uh, data from our devices to enable the digital twin so again that's taken us a few years to actually overcome this problem <laughs> is that feat actually so that's what i'm just curious to know but however when processing this digital pin as you mentioned the first and the foremost thing is to have a real accurate and precise data so whether it is possible what do you comment to <coughs> so sir uh, it is possible to the extent that a lot of times we may may not need very very precise three decimal or four decimal point accuracy data a lot of times the data that we need so if we so if there is i'll give you a very simple example if we want to monitor the production of a rolling mill and if we want to look at the rpm so again rpm doesn't need to be millimeter accurate rpm if it can be it can, if it can be centimeter accurate and that is manageable so the accuracy required depends on a case to case basis and in bro, in most manufacturing uh, setups today the sensors available can enable that sort of an accuracy because a lot of times the very detailed accuracy that you are talking about may not even be needed as such okay yeah so when you're talking about the uh, 3ms actually so after data transfer from 3ms so it should be stored in some unified database right right absolutely the object to be digitalized is more complicated and how the uh, you know unified database works why because singular database there i'm sorry i'm sorry uh, i lost you after unified database okay sorry so um, after the data transferred from the, you know 3m it should be stored in the unified database and if the object uh, to be digitalized uh, is more uh, complicated and how the unified database works why because it is a singular database actually correct 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 so again sir uh, you seem to be knowing all of the problems that we have faced in our earlier days uh, <laughs> so again this is a very very core problem because uh, what happens in manufacturing is that a lot of machines are every machine so if a person let's again talk about aluminum uh, mm -hmm. if a, if there are two separate companies working on aluminum rolling the two machines that they are going to be using are also going to be completely different the sort of data that would be needed from the two machines is also going to be completely different so structuring of the hardware structuring of the software and the architecture of the database becomes very very important so our database and 
our database and <clears throat> hardware structure is such that it can it has a lot of uh, in very layman terms it has a lot of empty fields such that we can more, uh, customize it according to the situation we're in so that is a hurdle which we've sort of solved through a very open sort of database. It costs us a little more to host. Uh, it costs us a little more to uh, maintain. But then the time to customize, the time to make everything suitable for a particular situation uh, greatly reduces. Okay. okay. Anyway, so these are all, I felt that was going to be the, you know, quite uh, challenging parts uh, when it was coming across your presentation. And I have a final last discussion to be done. So, uh, you know, so there, are, there are a lot of uh, twins like process twins and uh, component twins, SS twins, and I think system twins. Like that. So what type of digital twins is used in uh, your criteria? So whatever you are discussing about it, this is the most significant one and uh, what is your comment on it? Absolutely, sir. So essentially you making the digital twin of man, machine and material essentially enables us to make the digital twin of the complete manufacturing process from end to end. So that means when a raw material enters into the facility and when a complete finished product leaves the facility, <coughs> we want real-time analysis, real-time data of the complete process of what happens in the middle, who deals with the machine, who deals with the materials, what does the material do, what does the machine do. So we try to say that we are creating a digital twin of the complete manufacturing facility and not only individual uh, components, not only machines, not only man, not only material. So once we have a digital twin and we can visualize the complete manufacturing process, only then can we enable it to be a, li a little better and optimized and more efficient. So it may be like process tweaks. It, a lot of process tweaks, a lot of process, a lot of uh, hierarchy, HR, uh, process, machines, uh, cost of cost of actually buying new machines or actually getting rid of machines, cost of hiring people, cost of changing the processes, a lot of things. So a lot of process optimization and uh, process consultancy is also part of uh, an effective iotization or a digitization solution, definitely. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Antuna, and thanks, uh, Dr. Shyam. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question. Thanks for the answers, uh, Mr. Shantanu. Yeah, I, I see a question on the chat box, uh, which obviously starts with a compliment. Um, this is uh, Mr. Shantanu. You explained the basic concepts very well. Kudos. And then he has two questions. Uh, this is from Mr. Ganesh Arbhai. Uh, the two questions are: How is the system architecture set up, and uh, how how about on the data setting? So uh, for the system architecture, I'll just quickly share my screen again. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, so, uh, so there are various architectures in play here. So there is a complete flow architecture of how we operate. That means first we operate from a consultancy model. We explain what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and what would be the possible results. What I'm talking about here is essentially the hardware or the software solution, the technological solution architecture. So how that works is that there are various wireless independent sensors deployed. Again, these depend on the machine. So if there is in this case, uh, it looks like a boiler or a chemical reactor. In this case, various temperature sensors, valve sensors, current sensors are deployed wirelessly on the complete uh, uh, shop floor. These wireless sensors then ping all of the data to our gateway uh, through various local network communications like LoRa, like NB-IoT, like uh, 2.4 gigahertz, like Zigbee. All of this data is then pinged to our gateway. Then the gateway communicates either through with other gateways in the uh, facility and <coughs> combine all of the data and then throw it to the cloud through Wi-Fi or Ethernet in the case that there is Wi-Fi or, or Ethernet present on the manufacturing facility or through GSM. All of that data is then put on our server, on, our, on the Limelight IT server. We take care. Again, I, th I see the next question is security. So I'll talk about security as well. Uh, then we uh, put all of the data on the Limelight IT server, which is then displayed through the dashboard. Talking about security, 
so again we have to be very very careful when it comes to security and security is always a multi layered approach so security needs to be hardware security firmware security com local communication security um, cloud communication security gateway security so at multi at to answer your security question is multiple security based industrial standard security approaches have been taken at various level to prevent inputs from various ent various entry points because security threats can happen at the hardware level at the firmware level at the gateway level at the cloud level at the router level and even at the dashboard level so various security approaches have been taken because again as an organization we believe that industrial iot is a booming sector right now and industrial iot security is going to be the booming sector very soon because there's going to be a lot of threats that are going to be posed through industrial iot implementation so we see iot security and data security as paramount and various industrial standard security measures have been implemented across the architecture i hope that answers the question yeah thank you thank you mr shatnu i hope uh, mr ganesh got the answers uh, which was explained uh, very nicely by mr shatnu i believe we'll have uh, time for uh, maybe uh, more question from either any of the panelists or from the audience <clears throat> okay i see one more uh, just came up uh, in the chat box uh, mr nisar rohit uh, the question is in industry mostly companies prefer on prem data on premises data they don't want to send data over the cloud because of cyber threat uh, do you have something for that yes true and uh, thank you mr nisar uh, for that question that's a very great question and uh, again in our experience we have uh, deployed such solutions where uh, the uh, owners of the manufacturing facility did not want to put it on cloud because of security purposes we can i mean we don't have a problem our software is modular such that it can be deployed on local servers or on premise servers the only difficulty that we see is during updation and analysis so when we need to update our method, our software when we need to update our firmware when we need to update our analysis methodology when we need to check if if we if we need to give after sales support customer support then <clears throat> it becomes a little difficult because then remote access needs to be offered uh, to our technical team to get into that server and uh, actually take care of the complete solution complete system that becomes a little bit of a difficulty technically but <clears throat> otherwise it can definitely be done uh, it's a it's a it's a thought approach it's a met, uh, thought it's it's debatable whether an on premise server is safer than a cloud server but uh, again it can be done we have done it in the past thank you uh, there is one more question which just came up how failure of man machine and material is accommodated this is by mr ravi kumar okay so uh, <clears throat> again one of the problems uh, that we had while applying for this uh, research conclave was uh, we had to fit our uh, thoughts into uh, just four to six pages so failure of man machine and material is accommodated again is a very very is a very very detailed topic so i'll give you a very broad understanding when we acquire data we now suppose have data for the complete manufacturing process for man for machine and for material and now you take any particular ship so now assume i become the uh, plant manager or the plant head of that particular manufacturing facility and i take a particular shift and i see that the machine machine was up only for 80% of the times and 20% of the times it didn't operate so through a lot of ai based correlations a correlation as to whether the operator there has a history of poor up times with machinery that the material there does it have a history of always being stuck on this particular machine that time duration of the day that uh, time period of that shift particularly post lunch pre lunch there are n number of correlations that help us actually correlate and accommodate the failure and actually get to the root cause if it is the if the failure or if the downtime is due to the man the capacity the machine the material so again through a lot of analysis through a lot of ai we have actually been trying to get to a solid solution 
I we I honestly wouldn't say that we are hundred percent there yet. We are again any technological solution requires com com continuous updates. So I wouldn't say we are hundred percent there yet. But yes, we now have a good enough understanding such that through this uh, correlation, we help our clients enhance their efficiencies, enhance their manufacturing efficiencies by even up to fifteen to twenty percent. Okay, uh, thank you. Hopefully, that uh, answered the question. And I guess we are just right on time. So again, uh, take the liberty of just having uh, 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 posing the last question from my side. And in your experience uh, with digital twins, uh, do you have any um, uh, any uh, kind of uh, uh, intuition or gut feeling at this point in the uh, which vertical industry vertical is really uh, wanting to adopt digital twins? Uh, uh, you know, you know, in a big way, is it like aerospace, uh, chemical and process industry, power generation? Any any idea based on your experience? So, uh, what we understand is sir, that manufacturing industry. So, we've mostly been in the manufacturing industry based out of Gujarat, based out of Ahmedabad, and what we understand is that there is definitely a need because MSMEs and even large industries today understand the global nature, the global competitiveness of the market. And they understand the need for enhancing their efficiencies, enhancing their productivities. So definitely in the manufacturing sector, it's there. I feel eventually, uh, depending on which industry you're talking about, eventually industrial IoT or IoTization in general must be there and will happen in every field be it electric vehicles or smart mobility, be it industrial IoT, be it power generation, be it distribution, sales, everything will have def will have an element of IoT because the need, the importance of data is being understood largely by everyone. And there is, again, a global competitiveness, even post COVID, there's a global competitiveness that everyone needs to work towards. And people are now starting to understand that industrial IoT or digitization rather, is the way to go about it. Okay, okay. thank you. Thanks, Mr. Shantanu. Uh, I guess uh, uh, a very interesting talk and of course a very interesting set of discussions and uh, thanks for uh, giving all the answers with great clarity and uh, you know uh, thought. So uh, with that, uh, thank you once again on behalf of the organizers, uh, NASCOM, IIT, Dhanagar, and IIT Jammu for having uh, you know, uh, presented your paper at this uh, conclave. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, NASCOM. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shamsundar. Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And uh, uh, yeah, so now it's uh, time for me to present. So uh, just if you give me a minute, I'll share my screen. And uh, uh, can I be given access to share my presentation, please? Yes, sir, you have been given it. So you can try it. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Okay. Um, hope my uh, screen is visible and I'm audible. Yes, it's audible and visible. Please go ahead. Great. Okay, so thank you. Uh, um, <clears throat> the, the, this is the last presentation of this session and uh, I have the honor of uh, presenting that, and again, uh, uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for having uh, you know, given me this opportunity to share something on this topic of uh, NDE 4.0, uh, transforming industrial inspection. This is some going to be somewhat different from probably whatever things you heard since uh, uh, the morning, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll jump into it. So I would like to also thank my co-authors, Dr. Ripi Singh. Uh, who uh, runs an organization called Inspiring Next, uh, is a consultant in, based in the US, and uh, uh, Dr. Johannes Rana, who runs a NDE consulting uh, organization in Germany. So my journey for NDE 4.0 started about two and a half years ago when I was still working at the GE Research Center here in Bangalore. And uh, so, you know, this is kind of things which I have seen, learned, and uh, done in, the, the, uh, in a limited time. Uh, but this is an area which is closely related and could be co called a subset of industry 4.0 uh, because uh, every industry certainly does inspection uh, for be it for quality control or asset integrity and so on and so forth. Uh, this is also inspired by a very recent book which was launched just uh, three months ago. Uh, it's available on Amazon. 
called The World of ND 4.0, Let the Journey Begin. And this book is author, authored by uh, Dr. Ripi Singh and uh, Jonas uh, Rana, who are uh, my co-authors in this paper. So I've been kind of working with them uh, to see how we can bring ND 4.0 to uh, the Indian industry specifically, uh, both of them being located globally in the US and in Germany. So obviously acknowledgement for, uh, you know, this is a culmination of several personal experiences and my engagement with industrial R&D the last 37 plus years, uh, of course, and taken the liberty of innumerable web resources and several discussion with experts. So uh, industry uh, spectrum is an extremely large spectrum as all of you know, uh, no need to really explain this, but uh, the fact remains that uh, you know we are surrounded by this extraordinarily large spectrum of industries and verticals, as you might like to call it, be it oil and gas, aerospace, renewables, automotive, power generation, offshore, manufacturing, transportation, shipping, etc., etc., etc. And then, uh, and then, then you know, uh, you can also automatically understand the challenges which go into the uh, you know, uh, building of components and these structures and eventually the plants, uh, you know, and then eventually have to run the plants effectively, uh, you know, with as minimum failures as possible and so on and so forth. But, and so the biggest attention uh, the industries do pay uh, is always about quality. Uh, you know, we really want, they want to produce, uh, uh, even forget the, the final product which comes out has to be the highest quality, but the quality of their assets itself, the quality of the components and the structures which go into the plant, be it a refinery and the tons of uh, you know, uh, miles of pipelines which go, the number of reactors and so many other things, or be it a power plant which is a bio boiler or a turbine and so on and so forth, the quality uh, is plays a very essential role. However, in spite of the best efforts of mankind and engineers and technologists and scientists to build something which is very, very uh, you know, uh, good, which will last for its design life. The fact, reality is that uh, failures do happen. Um, what you see on your screen is certainly not a set of pretty pictures which you would ever like to see in our life. But the reality is this happens. Failures, engineering failures do happen. Be it a wind turbine, be it a railway accident due to a failure of the rail uh, track weld or an axle breaking. Uh, by even even as something as sophisticated as a NASA spaceship, uh, which fails because because there's so many components, the structure is built in spite of the best quality control in the world, which is imparted. Uh, things do happen. There could be material defects. There could be human error. There could be you know design errors. All kinds of things. So these things do happen. Uh, but uh, that the goal of all is engineers and technologists and scientists is primarily to see how we can prevent this failures. And that is where, uh, you know, uh, comes in the uh, domain of what we call as non-destructive valuation. You all would have heard the term probably, those who are in the industry, um, either the term NDT or NDE, that is non-destructive testing or non-destructive evaluation. And it's basically uh, for those who are probably not uh, uh, exposed to that, the very simple analogy is that of a doctor. Just like the doctor uh, puts uh, a set of tools uh, to investigate and diagnose a human being, uh, the NDT and inspection engineers use a set of tools and technologies to assess the health and condition of the industrial infrastructure and components and structures. And so NDE is a cradle to grave technology mainly because it starts right from the raw material when the uh, ore uh, is being mined till the, to, to the point where the material is being processed till uh, to the point again where the component is manufactured, assembled, put it into a structure inside a plant or any other structure, and then in service while the thing, be it an aircraft engine, be it a gas turbine, steam turbine, wind turbine, locomotive, everything well, while it is in service also undergoes a lot of inspection to see that it is in good condition or does it need a repair or a replacement and so on. And then it goes on to the end of life. So NDE is a cradle to grave technology. Uh, which is essential part of every any industry you take. There is no industry which is probably uh, doesn't use it. And so the industrial inspection, that is what we would like to call it in a general terminology, really, uh, you know, the scenario is where you need to know what is the component structure or asset to be inspected. It, this could be in a manufacturing plant or after it has been installed in a, in a refinery power plant or whatever, you know, the final uses. And then you typically choose an NDD technique, which again, 
You have a bunch of them, just like the doctors have it. We have ultrasound, electromagnetics, infrared, X-ray, optical, uh, you know, visual, and a bunch of other techniques. So you need to decide which one to uh, use for doing the inspection. And then you have an inspection process and procedure to be adopted, acquire data, do the analysis and interpretation, uh, decision and disposition, and maintain records and archive for the future. So the industrial inspection scenario is getting more and more complicated, and that's how you know, with Industry 4.0 trying to, uh, you know, make its presence felt, it is inevitable that the domain of NDE and inspection also adapts itself so that the whole uh, process of Industry 4.0 becomes successful. And then we have, you know, again, not getting into too many details, but, uh, you know, um, choice of method is there, you know, which technique could you use to do the inspection uh, based on the material, based on the size, thickness, what defect are you looking for? And then, you know, typically predominantly uh, stays a qualitative assessment. We have moved into the quantitative zone right now with ASME and ASTM codes, but then very, very uh, difficult. So, and we also need highly trained uh, personnel where again, you could think of enablers like AI, which could do the first pass inspection. We'll see some examples. Uh, data, obviously very difficult to inspect data. Now we have tried to move everything from data signals to images. So today, most of the entity methods do have images as the final output which makes it a little bit better for the operator to make his decisions. And of course, you know, filters the real world as we have heard again since morning, an extremely noisy world. And we need to figure out the uh, in item of interest or signal from this extremely noisy set of data. So the changing world of NDE is that uh, data sets becoming large and complex, which is obviously what we call as big data. Data arriving continuously. Again, you heard that in you know, the stocks on uh, structural health monitoring or conditioning monitoring, monitoring from remote uh, sites uh, using the IoT. Uh, interpretation of data becomes too difficult for an unaided human. Uh, so we need technical assistance through enablers like software and AI and other things. And the most important, the data has to be converted to useful information, uh, which could be potentially automated and decision-making could be automated using AI, ML and the likes. And so we are with Industry 4.0 and ND 4.0. It's all about taking the conventional inspection methods, enabling all the platforms, all the enablers which Industry 4.0 offers, and to take us the whole thing to, into the future. You know that is what we call you know uh, continuous next, which means technologies will evolve and interact to create the future. And so ND 4.0 kind of uh, got formalized uh, as one of the terminologies as a subset of industry 4.0 in the, in the last maybe three to four years, I should say. And it's gaining great ground. You know, there's been lots of work which is going on. There's a uh, you know, special issue on ND 4.0, which was brought out by the American Society for NDT last year. And the work is significantly increasing and the industry is paying more attention to ND 4.0 and how it can benefit. And of course, the evolution, uh, not, not to say the same thing like the industrial revolution, but in the case of NDE 4.0, it used to be non-destructive inspection, uh, where you typically use the basic senses of the human being, you know, uh, you know, be it sight, uh, smell, taste, you know, touch and hearing to do many of the, you know, uh, figure out what is wrong. And then we uh, move to, you know, methodologies which could highlight the surface only. Then we look at methods which could be used like deep inside, like X-rays, and then, of course, we got into digital processing. And then that's when we started calling ND 3.0 because we were able to quantify something. And now ND 4 is all about intelligent foresight. And like any other thing, you know, uh, the ND 4.0 also relies on the three steps of digitization, which is digitalization and digital transformation. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, most, most uh, uh, in, in the ND world and the inspection world, it is still with uh, the first two steps. It's all about digitization and digitalization. Uh, we are still way behind on the digital transformation, which is more of an organization uh, you know, at, at the level. So digital entity and whatever different terminologies, is a, it's the 21st century digital entity will accelerate the affordable fourth industrial revolution in a risk averse society. That's what uh, uh, we are certainly hoping. And since it's all about uh, automation, be it automation in the process of inspection, be it in the automation of the data analysis, uh, automation of uh, how we uh, you know, carry out the decision making, et cetera. Uh, there is enough, enough uh, uh, you know, kind of drivers, you know, speed, quality, any industry, be it the manufacturing industry or be it the uh, process industry, which, you know, uh, which is say, uh, producing something else as a final output. 
you know, the speed, quality, productivity, reliability, safety, harsh environments, fact that we have so many different sizes and shapes and volumes of, you know, structures in any plant, be it refinery, power plant, chemical plant, paper plant, you know, whatever you take, you know, automotive industry and so on. And of course, the biggest thing is inspection being carried out by human being, always having subjectivity and operator uh, fatigue, and of course, human errors. And today we have the world of images where most of the inspection methodologies, uh, popularly the X-ray or what is called the dye penetrant testing or ultrasonic or infrared imaging, they're all in the domain of uh, the final output being an image, which obviously uh, makes it a little better than just using signals. So we are just going to touch upon a few other uh, specific things. Uh, uh, radiography uh, is something which you all uh, would know even uh, from the medical world because when you probably had a fall and uh, you suspected a fracture, you went to the doctor, the doctor took an X-ray and uh, then decided if he saw a crack in the radiograph, he decided that it's a uh, you know a fracture and if he does not see a crack, it's potentially a ligament tear or a sprain and then you know you don't have to put on a plaster and so on. So exactly the same thing which happens in the industrial world. We use X, uh, X-ray X radiography to inspect objects. And it's a very powerful method because it can see through the material. But it has its own challenges of radiation safety and so on and so forth. And traditionally, the whole methodology has been based on using what, was called, what is called an X-ray film. It's exactly similar to what uh, several years ago we used to do in photography. We used to have the film which used to uh, take pictures, then go to the studio, get it developed, fixed and all that. And typically, if you remember, it would take 24 to 48 hours to get your photographs. Same is true here in the X-ray when you use film, uh, basically, you know, you have to take it to the dark room, do the development, developing, fixing. And it's the earliest you can get is about two and a half to three hours before you can get an image after the inspection incident. And that's where uh, the transition from film to digital has uh, happened quite a bit in the last two decades. We have moved from analog to something called computed radiography and to digital radiography. The difference being in the film radiography, you use a film, uh, you know, which is uh, the traditional film. Uh, take an image of an industrial object, then you go to the dark room, process it, and you get an image after three hours. In CR, which is computed radiography, you have advanced, uh, you have what is called as a reusable imaging plate, phosphor plate, and you uh, scan, take an image with an X-ray source. I put it into a scanner, you get an image in approximately two, three minutes. And now we have kind of migrated to what is called the digital uh, you know, uh, detector array, which is a you know, kind of solid state uh, detector where the image is instant, exactly like what you get in your you know, cell phone or something. You, know, you take a picture and the image is there. You don't even have a gap of even five seconds. And so that's where the X-ray world is moving. And film versus digital, the advantages have been shown quite a bit about how digital can really be very, very beneficial in terms of the quality of the image and so on. And the moment you make anything digital, as you all know, uh, the whole world changes in terms of the amount of image processing you can do, storage you can do, archive you can do and all that. So here are just some examples of how digital radiography is being used in the both in the manufacturing plant, in say in the pipe industry or many others, or right in the field where you can see on the top right hand side picture, it's right in the out in the field for weld inspection of pipelines and see and you can see some images below uh, of the uh, radiograph how you know you can see the weld effects very very clearly and of course if these digital detectors had not come industrial cd computer tomography or 3d imaging would not have been possible so the whole digital effort especially again in the x-ray and all the other inspection methods has revolutionized the way we are doing industrial inspection so today here you have this industrial CT machine, just like what the doctor has, uh, the CT machine. And we can see fantastic images of all industrial components. You can see a turbine blade, you can see an engine block, the internals, you can see with great clarity, do dimensional measurements, you know, go to take slices. I mean, the possibilities are enormous. And this would not have possible if we had not shifted to the digital radiography domain. So let's talk about a very few key pillars for uh, the ND uh, 4.0, like in industry 4.0, in, in everything we have these um, enablers, again, artificial intelligence and its subset of machine learning and deep learning form a very big part of ND 4.0 because uh, the, 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 the goal of any inspection or ND or industrial inspection is inspect using some method that is an output in the form of a signal and image. You have to make a decision whether that, that part is accepted 
uh, rejected or can be put to use after some repair. But in most inspections, the flaws or defects are rare. And most of this time spent on looking at data where there is nothing to be found. And that is tedious work. And that is where AI takes that tedious and taxing part of the inspector and lets the inspectors focus on the important parts. Here is an example of how AI is being used on image analytics. Um, you know, again, you know, where uh, be it an aircraft engine part, as you can see, the turbine blade or any anything, castings, automotive wheels, I mean, tons of them, you know, you take X-ray images of that and uh, typically an operator sits and analyzes that images for the entire shift of eight to 10 hours. He may be inspecting as high as 200 to 250 images per shift. And you can imagine, you know, how tiring that could be. And that's where now, you know, AI is jumping in and helping with image analytics where, you know, it's dying, as you can see in some of the images there, the porosity, you know, kind of has been flagged through those red dots. And the operator really needs to focus only on a subset of the 250 images per shift, which has been flagged by the AI algorithm. And it also helps in the automated defect recognition in any of these engineering components. It's again used in other methods. As you can see here, this is an example of uh, technology called phased area ultrasound, where again, you know, very popular use for weld inspections and uh, how uh, you know, neural networks and the combination of AI and other things can do automatic classification of defects and the type of defects. And that's again, a very big application of AI and uh, its subsets on data analysis in the NDT and inspection world. Here is a, a example of how uh, there's a popular method called fluorescent penetrant inspection in the industrial world. Many of your industries, you might be using it. You can see an image, you know, again, it's a very, uh, very basic technique, but very powerful. In fact, advanced industries like nuclear and aerospace use this technique very extensively for surface defects. And here is a, you know, it was typically, again, an entirely manual process. It's been completely automated. Not only the inspection part, but the analysis part where here you can see the crack on the top right corner of the fluorescent piece in you know, the crack you see is being identified by the AI algorithm uh, using an entirely unsupervised uh, method using combination of deep learning and other techniques. So that, that's the power of how AI can help industrial inspection by automating many, many of the aspects of the inspection. Here is an example of how AI in the wind turbine manufacture. Wind turbines, as you know, are huge structures, very long, very big. If you do an ultrasonic inspection on that, the data you collect is huge. And then, you know, now obviously, in the moment you have more data, there's more time spent by the operator to do the analysis. So here is how AI again has been adopted for ultrasonic data. And as you can see, at this, it said the, the time reduction was 25%, 75%. That is from six hours to one and a half hours. So huge, huge, uh, you know, uh, productivity and time benefit by the application of some of the ND. 4.0 enablers. One of the um, uh, questions which does come up about the about how do you you know qualify the AI and ML systems, especially in the area of NDT. So there's been a lot of work done on by this European uh, network for inspection and qualification, and they have brought up a very new document just end of last year uh, called qualification of an AI machine learning non-destructive testing system. So this really gives you you know, a, a methodology to follow, a framework to follow by which you can qualify your AI system. Because at the end of the day, you're doing it for quality control. Uh, how do you rely on your AI algorithms that it's doing the proper job? So there's plenty of work going on around that. Moving on from AI and, uh, uh, you know, ML and DL to another big area finding its place, uh, another enabler is the uh, augmented uh, virtual mixed reality kind of thing. This is again gaining a huge importance in the ND 4.0 world, and because it can do tons of uh, benefits again, you know, the training, the you know, visualization, and many of that. Though in its infancy, uh, we do see a high potential for the whole AR, VR, XR stuff happening more in the ND world. And here are some scenarios in the inspection world, industrial inspection for training, you know, for skill practice updation, uh, guidance in terms of procedures and codes integration. You know, operator performance evaluation, data analysis, visualization, and hazardous environment walk. That's something which is going to be very, very useful, especially when you're talking about hazardous chemical plants or nuclear plants. Um, robots are, again, another big enabler for industrial inspection, coming out in a huge way, uh, enabling ND 4.0. Very fancy and nice robots with great capability 
where we can put many different sensors, be it high definition cameras, be it uh, you know, ultrasonic sensors, send it into confined spaces like pressure vessels, pipelines, and many other places, gather enough and sufficient data in elevated uh, pipelines also, and you can avoid scaffolding in your plants, et cetera, and really do a fantastic job. And of course, combine that with analysis on using AI and you have a reasonably automated uh, structure in place. Uh, another enabler, uh, we see, see increasing importance and increase, improve, increasing, sorry, uh, uh, utilization is all drone-based inspections. Drones, again, becoming popular. You would all have seen that in the newspapers for various purposes. Uh, but here is how drone-based industrial inspection is, is, is going to revolutionize what we are seeing. So obviously, it has its own set of advantages. And here you can see several different situations in, in the offshore industry, in the wind turbine industry, in a refinery, in the power plant, many places where you could, you know, even in an aircraft, you know, Airbus manufacturing and then inspecting their planes externally using drones. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, very popular uh, inspections for drones is for wind turbines. Wind turbines, as you know, are huge structures, several hundreds of feet tall with 45 to 75 meters long wind blades made of composites. And here is how people do the inspection today. Hanging from ropes, they are doing an inspection of the blade or the tower. Very risky, very uh, you know dangerous, and obviously you know, uh, something we would like to avoid if it was possible. It wasn't till today. Now we have the drones, as well, and including offshore. You now offshore is again still, still more difficult. So here is now how drones are being extensively used for the inspection of wind turbine blades using different sensors. It could be a high definition camera, infrared camera, or now we are also using ultrasound. And you could you know, dramatically have huge productivity by, you know, it takes just 40 minutes to inspect the three blades of the turbine, which in the traditional way where they used to climb up and do would take anyway from three to four days. So that's the kind of benefits you can have. Another place where, uh, you know, it's finding great application is again boilers. Thermal power plants have these uh, boilers, uh, which converts uh, water to steam. And uh, they are like three to four story structures. And you know, miles and miles of tubes inside, huge structure. Um, typical annual shutdown periods of 15 days for a power plant, insufficient to do a perfect inspection because you have to raise the scaffolding, which takes four days. Then you do the inspection, then you have to undo the scaffolding. And uh, here is now how drone can, you know, uh, you can see in the lower bottom picture, how they're sending a drone inside. No human being also is going inside and they could really cut down the uh, boiler inspection time significantly in, that improves productivity and you know, uh, saves revenue. Of course, the reason uh, drones are popular is because of the um, have a several advantages. You know, you can less downtime to any plant. Uh, we can retrieve data immediately, lower exposure to risks, you know, and of course, you know, things like uh, asset reliability, many other things. Um, AI again uh, combined with robots can uh, inspect, uh, do the NDT inspections of complex surfaces. Uh, where it's uh, guided, uh, you know, and that makes it much easy to inspect those kind of uh, you know, surfaces very easily. Uh, again, combining AI with uh, drones, uh, again, makes it very easy today. Uh, you know, the entire path planning of a drone uh, can be done using AI. Uh, it also, uh, you know, the algorithms are smart enough to figure out where, which part of the turbine blades they need to inspect more uh, closely or more effectively by taking, say, more images or even you know, how it can be, uh, you know, it, it automatically uh, from real-time processing determines that if it detects a potential defect, like a bird hit or a lightning strike or any other damage on the turbine blade, uh, it needs to capture more and more images for that reason, because that's the area of interest. And then we have AI to automatically classify, as you can see in the lower left-hand, right-hand side, you know, whether it's a erosion type of defect, is it a crack, is it, you know, whatever it is. So, so AI combined with drone enabling fantastic industrial inspections of uh, wind turbines today. Of course, um, we are moving into the zone where it is not uh, one of one or the other is not sufficient. So we are trying to integrate the inspections done with a drone, with robots, and with crawlers on large structures like aircrafts, as you can see here, to really get you know holistic information, which then combined with uh, you know data fusion and uh, AI kind of stuff uh, can really give you a lot more information for decision uh, making, in, in especially in the case of uh, you know uh, large structures and critical structures. 
And of course, something which you have probably heard quite a bit since uh, morning is all about digital twin. And uh, again, uh, and DE and inspection plays a very important role in, in uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of augmenting that data and building the digital twins. Uh, you know, uh, we did have the uh, unique experience while I was still at uh, GE to uh, do build a digital twin for a, uh, for boiler tubes, uh, you know, failure, you know, boiler tubes. Uh, the biggest forced outage in Indian power plants is because of uh, boiler tube leakage. And that's because of the low uh, quality coal, high, high, uh, high ash content, leading to erosion of the boiler tubes and, uh, you know, uh, kind of causing the forced outages due to failures during operation. And uh, you know we are uh, able to build one uh, such that such digital twin to prevent uh, sorry predict uh, you know uh, uh, failures in boiler tube. So great opportunity for combining inspection data with uh, legacy inspection data as well as operational data for operational structures to really you know uh, you know kind of uh, and learn continuously through AI and make it a very very predictable tool for predictive maintenance and uh, things like that um yeah this is again something which was touched upon even in the keynote lecture in the morning about preventive maintenance uh, and uh, so our sort of predictive maintenance and going towards prescriptive maintenance and again nde 4.0 is a big big enabler for becoming better and better at predictive uh, maintenance because it's the inspection data which eventually guides the maintenance personnel to make a decision on when to uh, stop for maintenance and so on. So combination of digital twins and the uh, you know D4.0 and other enablers along with the core inspection technology can be a big asset for predictive maintenance. And so in all these, it's all about driving you know be it in the manufacturing plant or be it in the uh, installed plant. You know it's all about how you want to improve safety, availability, maximize the performance and reliability, which can be potentially done by combination of all of these. Uh, ND 4.0 enablers, which we have uh, talked about quite a bit. And this is how we see uh, ND 4.0 driving the future, where you know uh, it's all about integration of AR, VR, uh, along with AI, along with robots and drones, with the fundamental, which we can never forget, the basic sensor, which could be, as I said, a simple visual high-definition camera, an ultrasonic camera, electromagnetic uh, uh, ultrasonic uh, sensor, electromagnetic uh, sensor, or you know infrared sensor kind of thing, where you know all of that come and really make uh, in industrial inspection uh, a very you know uh, easy thing to do with greater reliability, greater safety of the operating personnel, and so on and so forth. So these are the uh, trends which are guiding uh, in uh, ND 4.0. Uh, things which you already all know of, so no need to go into the details, but increased automation to everything which you can see here on the left-hand side are the enablers for ND 4.0, which we are seeing, uh, you know, slowly uh, becoming uh, hopefully a reality in, in the world around us. So, and nothing comes without challenges. So the challenges for ND 4.0 uh, is about the cross-industry. Cross uh, yes, please. Sorry for interruption. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you should wind it up as it is. Yeah, yeah, this is my last thing. This is my last thing. Sure. So, um, you know, these are the challenges which come. Uh, and then, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, we also need to take care of both technical and non-technical considerations in ND 4.0. And, you know, qualifying advanced algorithms, like I told you, or any group. And, of course, the biggest thing, regulatory bodies and others who also play a role in this. Uh, industry skepticism, lack of awareness, and anticipation of labor force resistance, and of course, capital investment um, are all also part of the game which we need to take care of. So, in summary, uh, technology trends are changing pace never seen before in all the segments of the evolving world. And D4.0 has several enable enablers we talked about, can be adopted and utilized selectively and holistically for improved inspection, quality control, asset integrity management, predictive maintenance, life cycle management, and so on. Industry awareness uh, needs to be enhanced. Uh, certainly need for faster and accelerated testing. Uh, industry pull needed for adoption and development. And uh, so the mantra always is about innovate, evaluate, adopt, implement, and benefit. With that, uh, thank you uh, for your attention. Hopefully you got some insights into uh, a segment called ND 4.0, which is an important part of industry 4.0 and uh, industrial inspection, which is part, in an inevitable part of every in industry, be it manufacturing or process industry. Thank you very much.
Thank you very uh, much. With that, I am open to questions. So we can straight away go to Dr. Rajkumar first, and then we can take Amit's question. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Thank you, Dr. Sham. It is a quite interesting topic as well. And uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, inspection. And that is, uh, you know, very important factors when we are considering for maintenance wise. And I have a quick, uh, uh, some topics to be discussed here quickly. When we are talking about the predictive maintenance, the inspection controls, all these things. So I felt like, so a lot of parameters now, for example, I want to make a sensor and then I want to collect the data and the data should be analyzed using the ML techniques. So stage one, two, three, all this data monitoring is there. Then I have to come back uh, again for the production system to repairing or uh, retrofitting those sort of things. So how do you comment on this? So do we need to control a lot of parameters or is it going to be a very simplified way that I misunderstood actually? Um. No, I think see the uh, it's all about the understanding of the uh, structure or component which you are inspecting. Uh, once that is clear, which in most cases it is clear because if it's a uh, you know uh, you know uh, the industry which is working on, they really know uh, to a large extent based on legacy and uh, you know uh, information and experience what are the challenges which they face. So if you go to a refinery people per uh, person, you know you you really. I mean, you'll be surprised at the kind of uh, heuristic knowledge which they have, the, the maintenance and inspection personnel. Fantastic knowledge they have. They really are able to almost zero in on where the issue could be, right? So so that helps a lot. And the, the thing is that has come uh, you know, historically because of experience. The problem is as we as manpower depletes, how do we capture all this knowledge? And that's where we, we are looking for things like AI. So it's not... It, it, I, I won't oversimplify and say it's very easy, but certainly we know what to do because, because if it's an aircraft engine, we know it's a, you know, it's a fatigue damage. And we know it's about the biggest critical components are the turbine blades. And so, you know, what should be inspected uh, and where it should be inspected and what are we looking for is reasonably, is reasonably well known, uh, you know, in, in all this, both as I said, coming from historical data where failures have happened during production or manufacture uh, due to process issues or whatever it may be. About. So, so that is, um, is not uh, is not something uh, which I would uh, know, uh, worry too much about in the sense that uh, there is enough uh, knowledge, body of knowledge, which helps us to uh, do that. And so it helps us to narrow down on which technique, where to inspect and what are we looking for. And then uh, to get to the decision, and that automatically leads to the next step, which is either replace or repair. You know, if it is really in a bad condition, you know, pipeline where the corrosion has crossed forty percent of the wall thickness or fifty percent of the wall thickness, we have uh, limited choice. We have to stop operations. We have to cut that place and do a welding, and uh, you know this thing. And similarly, you know, and things like that. So, so they are all linked. But I think we have evolved an ecosystem um, in the industrial world very nicely. Uh, which is uh, really helping us to you know move forward uh, you know, without too much of hurdles. Yeah. So and uh, last uh, one thing I want to discuss with you, we have a very clarity that uh, we need to be the, all the industries they are all having awareness about how they have to maintain and what is a simplified way, otherwise a complicated way. They might have been done a lot of experiments as you mentioned clearly. The other thing is uh, just looking into it. Uh, what do you think about in situ uh, monitoring techniques or uh, and you are men mentioning about the in service monitoring techniques so as far as your expertise could you yeah, absolutely differentiate every i mean you you ask the what what we call as call as the holy grail question you know everybody wants in situ inspection nobody wants go to a power plant guy he will ask you you know, what can you inspect? Can you uh, inspect this steam turbine or gas turbine without opening the shell? The moment you open the shell of the gas turbine or steam turbine, gone. It's it's a clear one month shutdown. You can't do anything about it. Aircraft engine. Every airline wants to uh, does not want the you know uh, the air, aircraft on the ground is fine, but not engine on the ground. The aircraft on the ground, but engine on the wing is what they want. And they want to do an in situ inspection, and we have we have something called the boroscope ports where we do the boroscope inspection. But boroscope again can give you limited you know information, and coverage again is limited. So in situ inspection, you've all kind of hit the nail on the head. 
is the uh, you know the desire of every industry because any structure can be inspected without opening it uh, is what saves you know weeks and months of time but it is uh, you know you always are still limited because of access uh, because of the technologies because you know the sensor cannot reach the place like even in, in a gas turbine you can reach uh, say stage one two and three but not beyond it now you can't leave that uh, area uninspected which forces you to open the uh, shell and then inspect or even in an aircraft engine or and things like that so yes in situ inspection and that is why the similar thing happened in the wind turbine it's we call it up tower inspection right they don't want to bring the blade or the gearbox to the ground because the moment you want to do that you have to hire a crane which costs two and a half lakh rupees per day rental then you're losing almost seven to ten days because blades will come down you'll inspect it again take the blades up and at the end of it you might have found that there was nothing wrong with right but whatever you know um, annual maintenance blah 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 you did that so up to our inspection what can i do for the gearbox for the wind blades without having to break and that's where drones have come kind of an in situ inspection you know we can call that so in situ inspection the um, holy grail biggest desire of all industries what can you do without uh, dismantling the structure whatever that yeah. so that may be like uh, you know contactless like uh, you know radiography or tomography so these things also will be useful for in situ monitoring techniques right yeah, yeah any anything about but the more but things like radiography becomes very complicated because the devices are heavy uh, you know even though you have portable devices sending it into something is very very difficult that's why they use the boroscope which is an equivalent to the doc, doctor's endoscope you know and uh, you know uh, we are able to go through and uh, do whatever we can it has its limitations it will never be a 100% inspection but now we are developing more and more sensors which can go in yes in, including ultrasound that you know electromagnetic and things like infrared yeah the last one this session so you are talking about the drones which is inspecting the wind blades uh, thing so whether uh, there is some periodic uh, tables or times to go the drones and do the inspection and how i'm just wondering uh, when when the inspection will be happen with the wind turbine i mean the power wind turbine so this thing blades are yeah. happening yeah so typically you know uh, there are things which uh, you know uh, they have uh, tools where you can inspect from the ground you know, telescopes and stuff so whenever you suspect a damage on the wind blade which could be sometimes yeah. due yeah, to so bird hit or lightning strike actually you pitched up how they are suspecting the damage that's what i understand okay so so you know you have to just you know there is nothing but visual inspection oh it's, there is nothing else but visual inspection to the this thing so when you suspect then you want to go closer and inspect and get a better image to see whether it's really a damage like a crack or whatever it is and you saw some pictures which i showed you in my first second third slide how the wind blades are actually broken so you know it just broke all of a sudden you know? oh okay they knew if they knew about it they would have stopped the turbine and they would have replaced the blade but those blades just failed and last year last two years were phenomenally bad for wind turbines you know the number of turbines which have failed in europe and uh, us but just phenomenally high so it's a it could be a manufacturing defect which just got escaped uh, because it's a you know the whole wind turbine is made by hand labs you know so anything could be possible periodically they want to send the drones and check it whether it is check it, yeah It's that easy you can do 40 minutes as i showed you three blades not a big deal and shut down the turbine for one hour not huge loss of production do the inspection so now okay. i'm really really sorry to interrupt in between i know this is an interesting very interesting discussion going on but uh, now we need to check the time and see the time also we have one more question from amit if we can take it quickly and then we have to summarize the session and then we have to move on to the next segment yeah please i hope uh, i mean yeah yeah me please um no, no, i think maybe if, uh, dr rashkumar if you had more question you could i mean maybe one or two questions i i just had a very simple one um, which uh, first of all great work uh, dr sham it's it's really good to be reminded of my olden days of when he i mean it's, it's kind yeah. of a pleasure to seeing those end to end solutions again just two use cases maybe we can talk separately i mean where i wanted to speak is one is on the like you talked about the boroscope inspection right so what is the penetration of ar in the boroscope inspection now because i think that really makes a big use case about doing those inspections um using ar technologies i mean uh, uh, 
to combine to the visual inspection. So that that was the one. Second one was on the um, we used to have that online corrosion monitoring solution, which using that ultrasonic uh, technology, right? Um, and then there was a guided wave inspection also. Is there something the results are much better with the AI technology, which is kind of coming in, or like more different kind of a sensors are there, which which is making actually the um, those pipeline inspection in the refineries or maybe in the uh, product pipelines also making much kind of and better because uh, still the earlier the chances of detecting the corrosion was still not as high because from that ultrasonic sensor point of view you are only measuring one portion of it correct I and mean, that whole length was limited and then guided wave will all will have a separate limitation so mm -hmm. what is the advancement that has happened in that area and plus the application of uh, ar in the boroscope i think that application of ar on the boroscope definitely i see of a lot of interest right now so uh, but again i'm i'm a little worried about the time also so maybe we can take it offline sometime. sure sure i think we can take off and in general just a 30 second comment is yes advances have taken place in all the domains right from the sensors to the technology to the data analysis for decision making, uh, you know, fantastic uh, developments have taken place in the last one decade. Uh, certainly, we are seeing more companies, more startups. A lot of startups have come, especially for pipeline corrosion inspection, with novel technologies, and all of them are purely basing it on, apart from the fundamental, the IoT and the AI, without without a doubt. So clearly, there is a lot of advances. And then your second topic also, yes, horoscope inspection has made. A little bit of advancement, you know, with video boroscopes and some amount of image processing happening on board. Uh, but AR combination with boroscope is still something I have not seen uh, too much of it. There is some amount of AI into the image analysis, but not the AR integration with the uh, uh, boroscope. But certainly a great topic. And definitely should be because I, I I definitely see a lot of application of AR in the boroscope inspection. Absolutely, I, I could actually agree. change the way inspection gets done. So. Mm -hmm. Sure, we can certainly talk offline. Happy to, you know, anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I would love like to uh, invite Dr. Rajkumar to summarize the session. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nega, and uh, thank you, Dr. Shyam. So helping to be in co-chair, and uh, it's a very good, uh, you know, the three presenters, three different areas feels like you know having three different type of essence, like talking from. Uh, I know uh, the digital twins and the uh, talking about the maintenance and the in situ monitoring and monitoring techniques and uh, the social IoT things. So it, it gave a very good essence. And uh, when we when we were discussing about some technical aspects, so we got uh, some inputs from them also. And I hope uh, the audience also enjoyed the discussions and they got some input. And now they felt that okay next level of transformations how this industry 4.0 and uh, all these ai iot or ar perceives in the manufacturing field and in with respect to the development of data driven and uh, with respect to the development of digital twins and with respect to the development of uh, maintenance as well and inspection as well towards yeah i hope uh, it gives a uh, very good and uh, interaction sessions and uh, thanks all the uh, presenters as well as uh, uh, NASCAM team as well as the IIT Gandhina team as well uh, helping to co-organize all this sort of uh, presentation and track uh, session. It went well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, can we have quickly uh, some some I mean some closing points from Dr. Sham yeah. as a co-chair? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Rajkumar summarized it well. Very, very three different uh, uh, topics in, in some sense, I would say. So that gave, uh, give, I think, a very good flavor to the audience, hopefully. And, uh, you know, as I said, I was certainly, uh, you know, was hearing the social IoT for the first time as a terminology. So that uh, I enjoyed, you know, okay, understanding that something like that is there. And of course, the second talk on Digital Twin was uh, uh, also good to see that, you know, there are several... Uh, third-party companies now entering that domain and uh, doing and of course um, I won't uh, say much about my talk it's for others to judge uh, but I think yeah overall great session and thanks to um, NASCOM uh, and uh, IIT Gandhinagar and IIT Jammu the organizers of this conclave for having given me opportunity both to speak as well as to co-chair this session thank you very much thank you Dr. Rajkumar thank you Dr. Sham
for such an engaging session. I congratulate to all the researchers for their presentations and wish them all the very best. Soon we are going to announce best research paper award. Please stay tuned.